All right. So we are starting today at the beginning of book four of the Srimad Bhagavata Mahapurana. Finished book three at the end of last time. Um, so this is still in the discourse between um, Maharshi Maitreya and Vidura um, as being narrated. Um, not actually, it seems like by um, Shukadeva to Parikshit. We kind of covered that and then um, Shalnaka asked extra questions from Ugrasrava uh, Sutta. And so we're um, getting the narration from there. So Srimad Bhagavata Mahapurana, book four, discourse one on the progeny of Svayambhuva Manu's daughters. Maitreya continued, three daughters were also born to Svayambhuva Manu through Shatarupa, his wife, besides his two sons, Priyavrata and Uttanapada. The daughters were known by the names of Akuti, Devahuti, and Prasuti. Devahuti, we of course have heard all about. She was um, Kapila's mother. With the concurrence of Shatarupa, meaning with the, in agreement with his wife, he gave away Akuti to Ruchi Prajapati, treating her as a putrika, um, even though she already had brothers. A putrika means um, they had the agreement that her, her first son would be adopted by her father and raised as his son. Um, this is something that would usually be done by a parent who had only daughters um, because in Vedic culture, there are certain roles for a son versus a daughter. So if you only have daughters, often you'll arrange that the first, your first grandson, you will raise as your son. Um, so they made the unusual arrangement here to do that even though he did have sons. The worshipful Ruchi, who was a Prajapati, a Lord of created beings, and invested with the spiritual glory appropriate to a Brahmana, begot through Akuti a pair, a male and a female child, uh, meaning twins, one boy and one girl, after propitiating the Lord through his supreme concentration of mind. Of them, the male was no other than Lord Vishnu, who takes the form of sacrifices and was known by the name of Yagna, the avatar known as Yagna. And the female was Dakshina, who was a part manifestation, an anchavatara of Lakshmi, and hence inseparable from the Lord. Um, interesting that they were um, born as twins, um, as siblings, when their relationship is typically romantic, and actually was in this case too. Full of joy, Svayambhuva brought his daughter's son of boundless glory to his home, as stipulated, adopted him. While Ruchi accepted Dakshina and raised her as his own daughter. Lord Yagna, who was the ruler of all sacrifices, married Dakshina, his own twin sister, who longed for him and was much delighted. The Lord felt gratified and begot through her 12 sons. These 12 sons were, um, um, these are the devas of their Manvantara. Their names were Tosha, Pratosha, Santosha, Bhadra, Shanti, Idaspati, Idma, Kavi, Vibhu, Svahna, Sudeva, and Rochana. It was these who held the office of devas in the Svayambhuva Manvantara and were collectively known as the Tushitas. They were the equivalent of the Adityas in our Manvantara. Um, whereas we in our Manvantara have the 12 Adityas, the children of Aditi. In the um, Svayambhuva Manvantara, there were the 12 Tushitas. Um, instead. Marichi and others figured as the Saptarishis of that, of that Manvantara, while Lord Yagna himself filled the place of Indra. Priyavrata and Uttanapada, who were possessed of great might, were the two sons of Manu. Their sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons, as well as their progeny, meaning ongoingly, their generations, ruled for the whole length of that Manvantara. The line was unbroken. As for Devahuti, his daughter, Manu gave her to sage Kardama Prajapati. Oh dear Vidura, their story has already been heard by you from my mouth almost in full. And the worshipful Manu gave Prasuti, his third and youngest daughter, 
to Daksha Prajapati, um, a Manasaputra or mind-born son of Brahma, whose numberless descendants are spread all over the three worlds. Now here, as I tell you about the sons and grandsons of the nine daughters of the sage Kardama, who became the wives of Brahmana sages and of whom I have already spoken. So we heard about them um, and how they, who they married, but we have not heard who their children were. The daughter of Kardama named Kala, the wife of Marichi, bore Kashyapa and Purnima, whose race filled the universe. Purnima, Ovidura, begot Viraja and Vishvaga, and Devakulia, a daughter, who in her next incarnation descended in the form of the heavenly river Ganga uh, from the waters washing the feet of Lord Vishnu. Atri's wife, Anasuya, gave birth to three well-renowned sons, Datta, that's Lord Dattatreya, the sage Durvasa, and the moon god, Somadeva, who were severally born as manifestations of Lord Vishnu, Lord Shiva, and Brahma, um, specifically um, Durvasa was an avatar of Shiva, Somadeva is an emanation of Brahma, and Dattatreya is a co-avatar of all three. Um, some say a, a greater portion of Vishnu, but um, he has all three of the Trimurti in him. Um, it doesn't mention here, but they also, um, Atri and Anasuya also had a daughter. Uh, Sruta Kirti, I think her name was a star goddess. Vidura said, with what intention did the three foremost gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, who are severally responsible for creation, preservation, and destruction, appear in the house of Atri? Tell me this, my master. Maitreya replied, urged by Brahma to multiply creation, the sage Atri, the foremost of the knowers of Brahma, removed with his wife, meaning went away from society with his wife, to the Riksha mountain, one of the principal mountain ranges, intent on practicing austere penance. On that mountain, clothed with a forest of Palasha and Ashoka trees, which was laden with bunches of flowers and echoed on all sides with the sound of the waters of the Nirvindhya river falling on its rocks. The sage subjugated his mind by means of pranayama and remained standing on one foot for a full century, subsisting on the air and defying cold and heat and other such pairs of opposites. Um, I just want to mention the the place where Atri and Anasuya's ashram was, it's a known place in India. Um, I actually got to visit it about uh, 11 years ago now. And it's really, this, this description is accurate. It is up on the mountain um, clothed with the forest of Palasha and Ashoka trees, flowers and the, the river on the rocks. All of that is exactly the way it is. It's a really beautiful place still. Um, the thought which was foremost in his mind was I resort for protection to him who is the Lord of the universe. May he bless me with offspring like himself. Seeing the three worlds being tormented with the fire produced by the fuel of pranayama and issuing from the crown of the sage's head. All the three lords, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva went to his hermitage. Their glory was being sung by Apsaras, sages, Gandharvas, and Siddhas, Vidyadharas, and Nagas. His mind being flooded with light by their simultaneous appearance, the sage stretched himself up even on one leg. So even though he was already standing on one leg, he stood straighter and saw the three foremost gods seated severally on a swan, Garuda, and the bull Nandi, and distinguished by their characteristic marks um, that Brahma had his Kamandalu, his pot, Vishnu had his chakra, uh, Shiva had his Trishula, and so on. He greeted them by falling prostrate on the ground and paid them homage with articles of worship in the hollow of his palms, like water and flowers. Their gracious look and smiling faces bearing testimony to their pleasure. The sage closed his eyes, which were dazzled by their splendor, probably also because his eyes had been closed for a hundred years and so were especially dazzled by a sudden bright light. And collecting his mind, which had conceived a fondness for him, Extolled with joined palms and in sweet and significant words, the three gods who were the greatest of all in the whole universe. Atri said, you are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, who assume, who assume a personality at the beginning of every kalpa with the help of the three gunas of Maya, divided for the purpose of creation, preservation, and destruction of the universe. I bow to you all. Of you three, who was called by me here? It was the one Lord, 
the foremost of all the gods, whose presence here was invoked by me in order to be able to beget children. How then did you all come here, you who are beyond the reach even of the mind of embodied beings? Be pleased to tell me, for great is my wonder at this. Maitreya went on. Hearing these words of Atri, the three foremost divinities laughed and replied to the sage in sweet accents as follows, O mighty Vidura. The deities said, as you willed, precisely so it must happen. It could not be otherwise, for it was your will, O Brahmana, you who are so true of resolve. We three taken together represent the truth on which you contemplated. Now there will be born to you, may you be blessed, three sons embodying our rays, who will themselves be celebrated throughout the world, O dear sage, and shall spread your fame too. Having thus granted the boon sought after by him, and duly worshipped by the Brahmana couple, Atri and his wife. The three rulers of the gods returned thence each to his own abode, even as the couple stood looking on with wide open eyes. The moon god was born with a portion of Brahma, while Dattatreya, uh, a master of yoga, appeared with a ray of Lord Vishnu, and the sage Durvasa represented a portion of Lord Shankara. Um, so the, it doesn't mention, um, it doesn't go into all the detail of their other child here who wasn't part of this story and wasn't an, wasn't an avatar of any of the three, um, but Atri and Anasuya did also have a daughter, Sruta Kirti, who became a star goddess. Now here, of the progeny of the sage Angira, another mind-born son of Brahma. Angira's wife, Sradha, gave birth to four daughters, Sinivali, Kuhu and Raka, Anumati being the fourth. Um, there's a footnote here explaining them since the Bhagavatam doesn't go into detail about them. Um, that uh, Sinivali is the deity who presides over the 14th day of a dark fortnight, um, meaning like the, uh, the day of the dark moon. While Kuhu presides over the 15th, the, the first new moon. Even so, Raka is the goddess of the full moon day and Anumati of the 14th day of every bright fortnight. So the moon just becoming full. Besides these, they had a couple of sons too, who attained celebrity in the Svarochisha Manvantara, the next one after the Svayambhuva. The really worshipful Utatya and the sage Brahaspati. Haspati, has <laughs> uh, the sage Brahaspati who was the foremost of the knowers of Brahma. Of course, Brahaspati, um, Brahaspati did not become the Deva Guru in the Svayambhuva Manvantara. Um, he attained to that in the next Manvantara, in the Svarochisha. Pulastya, the fourth mind-born son of Brahma, begot through his wife, Havirbhu, the sage Agastya, who took the form of the gastral fire in his next incarnation. He became one of the Agni Devas, the Agni Deva within the body. And the great ascetic Visrava was his second son, was Pulastya's second son. Of the latter, Visrava was born the god Kubera, the lord of the Yakshas, son of Idavida, while Ravana, Kumbhakarna, and Vibhishana were born to his other wife, Keshini. Um, Keshini was part Rakshasa, part um, Asura. So her, her children, those are of Ramayana fame, Ravana, Kumbhakarna, and Vibhishana. Um, and actually, um, Kubera, his, their half-brother, one of his other names is Vaishravana, and it's a kind of a common pair in Vedic culture to give siblings similar names at times, um, often one kind of incorporating the name of the other, like Mali and Sumali, um, Heranyaksh and Heranyakashipu, uh, Ravana and Vaishravana was one of those. Uh, Vaishravana is better known by his other name, Kubera. And it was after their father, Vishrava, that they were named. Pulaha's virtuous wife, Gati, bore three sons, Karmasreshta, Variyan, and Sahishnu, O talented Vidura. Even so, Kratu's wife, Kriya, brought forth 60,000 sages, collectively known as the Valakilyas, all burning with spiritual glow appropriate to a Brahmana. By his wife, Urja, O chastiser of enemies, Vasishta, the seventh son of Brahma, had seven sons, Chitraketu and others, who all turned out to be pure-hearted Brahmana sages. They were Chitraketu, Surochi, Viraja, Mitra, Ulbana, Vasubhradya, 
Vasubhradhyana uh, and Dhyuman. He had other sons too, Shakti and so on, by another wife. Atarva's wife, um, Chitti or Shanti, got a son, Dadhichi, also known as Ashvasira, who had taken a vow of austere penance. Now hear from me of Bhrigu's race. The illustrious sage Bhrigu begot through his wife, Kyati, two sons, Dhata and Vidhata. That's another example of what I'm talking about, this naming siblings, names where one includes the other. It's a common Vedic custom. And a daughter named Sri, an um, avatar of the goddess Lakshmi, who, of course, was devoted to the Lord. The sage Meru severally gave away his two daughters, Ayati and Niyati, to these two sons of Bhrigu. By them, Ayati and Niyati, respectively, Dhata and Vidhata, severally had two sons. Um, so in other words, Ayati and Dhata had Mrakanda, Niyati and Vidhata had a son named Prana. The celebrated sage Markandeya was the son of Mrakanda, while the sage Veda Shira was sprung from the loins of Prana. Markandeya is a very, very famous sage. He has a whole Purana named after him. Uh, one of the two most important Shakta Puranas. The sage Bhrigu had one more son, Kavi by name, who had the worshipful Ushana for his son. Ushana, that's uh, Shukracharya, the um, Asura guru. The above mentioned sages too peopled the, world, uh, peopled the worlds with their descendants, O Vidura. I have thus given you an account of the progeny of Karadama's grandsons which is the best and quickest means of driving away the sins of a man who would listen to it with reverence. I praise for a list of genealogy, um, but it's particularly important because this isn't just an obscure old piece of ancient genealogy. These are like the, the births of the races of tons of creatures and all the lokas of many of the gods of many of the septarishis and so on. Um, Daksha, another mind-born son of Brahma, accepted the hand of Prasuti, the third daughter of Swayambhuvamanu, and through her he begot 16 fair-eyed daughters. Daksha gave away 13 of them to Dharma, Dharmadeva, um, that's um, Yamaraja, another name of him, another to Agni, still another um, to all the Pitris combined, and the, so she's the joint wife of all of the Pitris, and the last one to Bhava, who cuts us under the bonds of worldly life. Bhava being, of course, Shiva. Sraddha, Maitri, Daya, Shanti, Tushti, Pushti, Kriya, Unnati, Buddhi, Medha, Titiksha, Kri, and Murti are the names of Dharma's wives. Of them, Sraddha bore Subha, Maitri, Prasada, Daya, Abhaya, Shanti Sukha, Tushti Mud, a daughter named Mud, and Pushti gave birth to Smaya. Kriya brought forth Yoga, Unniti Darpa, Buddhi Artha, Medha Smriti, a daughter named Smriti, Titiksha Kshema, Hri, a son called Prasraya, and Murti, who is a mine of all virtues, bore the sages Nara and Narayana on whose descent the whole world rejoiced, highly pleased, and the minds of all beings, as well as the quarters, the winds, rivers and mountains became placid and tranquil. Musical instruments played in heaven, showers of flowers rained, sages offered their praises, gratified, the Gandharvas and Kinnaras sang and celestial women danced. There was supreme felicity, and Brahma the creator and all the other divinities waited on the Lord with songs of praise. Um, so there's a footnote here explaining about these, um, these first 12 wives of Dharma, all the ones besides Murti, are the deities presiding over virtues and mental states and, the, and other phenomena that, are, that they're named after or that are named after them, perhaps. Um, reverence, friendliness, compassion, mental calmness, complacence, uh, or complacence meaning kind of acceptance of whatever comes in a, in a, in a spirit of unattachment, prosperity, formal worship, like the process of formal worship, advancement, prudence, intelligence, forbearance, and modesty. Um, and their, their sons and daughters are also the embodiments of other virtues, mental states, and phenomena, which are said to be 
the direct outcome of the previous ones, not only because they were their child in a personified way, but because the one quality causes the other quality. Um, these are um, good fortune, placidity, fearlessness, happiness, joy, pride, mental concentration, arrogance, opulence, understanding, peace of mind, and civility. Um, and if you want, you can match them all up and see which one causes which one and so on. So upon the birth of the, um, the double avatars, Nara and Narayana, the gods said, obeisance to that supreme person who manifested in himself this universe created by his own Maya, even like the phenomenal appearances in the sky, um, as of like, um, referring to like the fantastic appearance of the sky at like sunset or dawn or the northern lights or something like that as kind of a metaphor for these illusory or mirage-like yet spectacular and beautiful apparitions. Um, they're saying that that's what the universe is like. And who has appeared today in the house of Dharma in the yonder form of a sage in order to reveal that self. May he whose true nature can only be inferred be pleased to look on us, the gods who have been created by him by means of sattva in order to put an end to any disturbance in the orderly existence of the world with an eye full of compassion, an eye which outvies the shining lotus, which is the abode of beauty um, or the abode of Lakshmi. It could also be translated. Thus extolled and honored by the gods who are blessed by their sight, the Irvidura, the two divine sages, Nara and Narayana, left for the Gandhamadana mountain. It is those two part manifestations of Lord Sri Hari that appeared in this world with a view to relieving the earth of its burden in the person of Sri Krishna, the ornament of the Yadus, and um, Arjuna, also known by the name of Krishna, the foremost of the Kurus. So what the actual verse said here is, appeared in the person of Krishna, the jewel of the Yadus, and Krishna, the jewel of the Kurus. The former, of course, being Sri Krishna and the latter being Arjuna. Um, Arjuna was very dark skinned, and so he too was called Krishna. Svaha, um, Svaha Devi, that's um, Agni's wife, bore three sons, Bhavaka, Bhavamana, and Shuchi, all of whom are deities presiding over fire and partake of the sacrificial offerings. From these again sprang up 45 additional fire gods. It is these 45 together with their fathers and grandfather that make the 49 Agni Devas. These are the 49 sacred fires in whose name Ishtis intended for the propitiation of the fire god are undertaken during Vedic sacrificial performances by men well-versed in the Vedas. The Agnishvatas, the Barhishads, the Somyas, and the Ajyapas. These are the four main divisions of the Pitris. Uh, the Pitris are the um, souls of the ancestors of, of living beings. They are either Sagnika or Niragnika. Uh, literally, Sagnika, Niragnika, this just means with fire or without fire, meaning some of them receive libations of water that are poured into the sacred fire. The Niragnika receive libations of water without fire being involved. Svadha, daughter of Daksha, is their common spouse. She very well may have more spouses than even Krishna. <laughs> In fact, I'm sure she does. She must have millions and millions of, of husbands. Svadha bore them a couple of daughters, Dharini and Vayuna, both of whom not only mastered the scriptures, but also attained spiritual wisdom and further taught such spiritual wisdom as gurus. Sati, Daksha's youngest daughter and the consort of Bhava, that's Lord Shiva, was devoted to Lord Bhava, but did not get a son resembling her in good qualities and character. For um, the reason she didn't is because before she could, while yet very young, she dropped her body of her own accord by dint of yoga in a spirit of indignation against her father on account of his antagonism against Lord Bhava, who had done him no wrong. Um, and this genealogy is abruptly interrupted there because Vidura asks about that. Thus ends the first discourse forming part of the dialogue between Vidura and Maitreya in book four of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Samhita.
Discourse two on the ill feeling between Lord Shiva and Daksha. So Vidura interrupts and gets us into this whole long other story. How did Daksha, he asked, who was fond of his daughters happen to bear ill will toward Lord Bhava, the foremost among those possessed of an amiable disposition, disregarding his own daughter, Sati. Who would bear enmity and how could anyone bear enmity to him, the teacher of the whole animate and inanimate creation? Who bears enmity to none? is possessed of a tranquil personality, delights in his own self, and is the highest object of veneration to the universe. Be pleased to tell me, holy sage, what led to such bitterness of feeling between the son-in-law and the father-in-law as compelled Sati to give up her very life, which is so difficult to part with. Maitreya replied, of old, all foremost seers and sages, as well as hosts of divinities, including the devas presiding over the sacred fires, accompanied with their attendants in a sacrificial session held by the Prajapatis. Daksha too appeared there, shining like the sun and illumining the grand assembly by his splendor. With their mind overwhelmed by his brilliance, those assembled there, including the deities presiding over the sacrificial fires, rose from their seats when they saw him, excepting, of course, Brahma, his father, and Lord Shiva. Duly honored by the superintending priests, the worshipful, uh, the idea being that um, to rise from your seat during a yagna when someone arrives is kind of an indication that you're offering them the respect of an, of an inferior to a superior or of a child to an elder. Um, so naturally Brahma and Shiva continued doing what they were doing and everyone else rose. Duly honored by the superintending priests, the worshipful Daksha bowed to Brahma, the progenitor of the universe, and took his seat with the latter's permission. Seeing Lord Shankara, the delighter of the world, already seated and receiving no attention from him, Daksha grew indignant. He looked with angry eyes at Shiva as if he would burn him and exclaimed, listen to me, O Brahmana sages, along with the gods, including the deities presiding over the sacred fires, as I speak to you about the conduct of pious souls, neither from ignorance nor from spite. This shameless fellow has wrecked the fame of the guardians of the spheres, and as much as the arrogant man has violated the path trodden by the virtuous. He has become a veritable son to me ever since he accepted the hand of my daughter, who is another Savitri, as it were, in the presence of Brahmanas and the sacred fire like a good-natured soul. Though he has taken the hand of that fawn-eyed girl, this monkey-eyed fellow did not show due courtesy to me even by word of mouth, when he ought to have risen from his seat and greeted me. To this haughty and impure person, who has not only abandoned all pious acts, but has outstepped all bounds of propriety, I gave away the girl, though unwilling to do so, even as one would impart the Veda to a Shudra. Surrounded by spirits and troops of ghosts with his hair scattered about, now laughing and now crying, he roves about uncovered, meaning naked, like a madman and frightful crematories, the abodes of spirits. Bathed in ashes of funeral piles and adorned with a garland of skulls befitting spirits and wearing ornaments of human bones, he is really inauspicious, though bearing the appellation of Shiva, which means all auspicious. Drunk himself, he's fond of drunken people and is the lord of goblins and ghosts. This is translating uh, like um, pramatas and bhutaganas and such, who are purely tamasika by nature. At the, inst at the instance of Brahma, alas, I gave away my virtuous girl to such an impure and evil-minded person, the Lord of Ghosts. Um, Lord of Ghosts is translating things like um, Bhutanata or Bhutesha, names of Shiva. Maitreya continued, having thus reviled Lord Shiva, uh, who has his abode on Mount Kailasa and who remained unmoved without the least show of resistance, Daksha now sipped a little water and indignantly proceeded to curse him. Yonder Bhava, the vilest among the gods, shall no longer get a share in the sacrificial offerings along with the other gods, such as Indra, the Lord of Paradise, Upendra, and so on. Upendra is a name of Vishnu, specifically of Vishnu's um, Vamana avatar. Upen what Upendra means is little Indra, um, both because he's physically very short, he's a dwarf, and also because he is Indra's younger brother. He was um, later born of Indra's same mother, Aditi. Um, having pronounced this imprecation upon Lord Shiva, though warned against such a course by the leading members of the assembly, Daksha 
Um, uh, presumably they were warning him as he did it and he just didn't pause to listen. Daksha left the place highly enraged and returned to his own abode, O Sion of Kuru. So he quit, he quit the yajna. Having come to know of this execration, Nandishvara, the foremost of Lord Shiva's attendants, grew wild with rage and uttered a terrible curse on Daksha as well as on those Brahmanas who had countenanced his blasphemy. So anyone there who didn't speak up against it. This fool who makes much of his mortal frame and bears enmity to the divine Shiva who has no vindictive spirit in him and looks upon this body, etc., as his own self shall have his face turned away from the truth. In other words, that Daksha looks upon his body as his self. He's, he has slipped into ignorance and arrogance. Attached to his home, the duties pertaining to which involve the practice of many a self-deception in the search for carnal pleasures and deprived of his judgment by attractive promises contained in the Vedas, he, rem he remains engaged in elaborate rituals with his mind ever contemplating on the sun self as the self, uh, meaning being overly attached to one's offspring. Um, Daksha has forgotten the true nature of his self and has become a brute. He shall therefore be excessively fond of women and shall have his head forthwith changed into that of a goat. This stupid fellow who regards ignorance in the form of addiction to rituals as wisdom and has slighted Lord Shiva and those who follow him. Um, so he, Daksha, and those who follow him shall be born into this world again and again, with their mind bewildered by the alluring, sweet, and profuse odor emitted by the flowery texts of the Vedas. These enemies of Hara shall remain infatuated, eating anything and everything, and devoted to learning austerity and sacred vows only for the sake of their livelihood. In other words, they're only doing, they're going through the motion of being Brahmins for the sake of making money. The Brahmana shall wander in this world as beggars, finding delight only in wealth, physical comforts, and the gratification of their senses. Hearing him thus pronounce a curse upon the Brahmana race, the sage Brugu uttered a counter curse, which was difficult to revoke, being the punishment inflicted by a Brahmana. They who observe vows sacred to Bhava and those who follow their latter shall become heretics and act contrary to the true scriptures. Only those who have cast all purity to the winds are silly minded and wear matted locks, ashes and bones shall get themselves initiated in the cult of Shiva worship where wine and other spirituous liquor will be held in high esteem. Because you denounce the Vedas which lay down the bounds of propriety for men and thereby preserve the society as well as denouncing the Brahmanas. Therefore, it seems you have embraced the creed of heretics. The path chalked out by the Vedas is the eternal and the only blessed path for the people, a path which has been trodden by the ancients and has the authority of Janardana. Condemning as you do the Vedas, which constitute the supremely faultless and eternal path of the virtuous, do you take to the path of heretics, or that lord of the ghosts is the deity. Maitreya went on. While Bhrigu was thus uttering his imprecation, Lord Bhava, along with his retinue, left the assembly hall a bit disconsolate at heart, as it were. So like, oh, he's, all, all these arrogant sages are just throwing curses at each other. So Shiva and his followers got up and walked away. The lords of created beings, O Vidura, um, literally he said, oh, great archer, we're addressing Vidura, duly carried on the sacrifice. So the other Prajapatis tried to make the best of it and picked up the Yagna and did it for a thousand years the sacrifice in which Sri Hari, the supreme being, was the deity being worshipped. At the conclusion of the sacrifice, they took their bath in the Ganga, where it is joined by the Yamuna, and with their mind and so at the at the Prayag, and with their mind and body cleansed of all impurities, they all returned therefrom, each to his own abode. Thus ends the second discourse entitled Daksha's Imprecation in Book Four of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse three on Sati, insisting on joining the sacrificial festival at her father's. Maitreya resumed. While Lord Shiva and Daksha, the son-in-law and the father-in-law, thus continued to bear lasting enmity to each other, a very long time elapsed. Now that Daksha was installed by Brahma, the highest of the gods, as the chief of all the Prajapatis, he was puffed up with pride. Having performed a Vajapeya Yagna, and insulted those who were most skilled in sacred knowledge by his overbearing demeanor. 
he now commenced the greatest of all sacrifices known by the name of Brahaspati Sava. Um, since it is laid down in the Srutis that after performing a Vajapeya Yagna, one should next undertake a Brahaspati Sava Yagna. In that sacrifice, all the Brahmana seers, as well as celestial sages, Pitris, and Devas, were adorned with all kinds of jewels, and their wives, too, were similarly adorned along with their husbands. At that time, goddess Sati, daughter of Daksha, heard of the great sacrificial festival at her father's from the mouth of heavenly beings who were passing through the air and talking loudly about where they were going. She also saw charming spouses of Gandharvas and Yakshas with rolling eyes, dressed in fine costumes and adorned with polished earrings and wearing gold ornaments round their necks, flying in their aerial vimanas with their husbands from all directions past her own abode, flying past Mount Kailasa. In her eagerness to go join the party, she spoke to her consort, the god Shiva, the lord of the ghosts, Bhutanatta. Sati said, I hear a grand sacrificial festival has been set on foot at the residence of your father-in-law, the Prajapati. Let us also go thither, if you so desire, O Vamadeva. These heavenly beings are all going there. My sisters will surely attend it with their husbands and their eagerness to see their kinsfolk. I too long to be there with you and receive the presents that will be, that will be bestowed on me by my parents. There I hope to see my own sisters, the esteemed of their spouses, as well as my mother's sisters, and above all, my own mother whose mind is so full of affection for me, for all of whom my heart has been yearning for a long time. My heart has been yearning for all these people, my, my mothers, my aunts, my sisters. And I shall also see my blissful Lord, the great sacrifice which is being performed by eminent seers. This wonderful creation consisting of the three gunas and brought forth by your own Maya appears in you. Nevertheless, I, a pitiable woman and ignorant of your reality, long to see my native place. O birthless Shiva, the ultimate source of the universe. Behold, my birthless Lord, other women, also richly adorned, going with their consorts in large numbers. The sky looks charming with their moving aerial vimanas, white as swans, O Lord, with a dark spot in the throat. That's um, referencing a story that we'll get to later. How can the mind and body of a daughter remain unmoved, O chief of the gods, on hearing of a festivity at the house of her parents? People go to the house of their husband, guru, parents, and other near and dear ones, even uninvited. Therefore, compassionate as you are, be pleased to grant this desire of mine, O immortal Lord. Though possessed of infinite wisdom, you have located me in the left half of your own person, in the Ardhanarishvara um, form. Therefore, do me this favor as entreated by me. The sage resumed. Thus importuned by his beloved spouse, Shiva, the Lord of Kailasa, who is so loving to his relations, was reminded of the shaft-like words of reproach, meaning um, arrow-like or cutting words of reproach that Daksha had uttered in the presence of the other Prajapatis and which were cutting to the quick. He therefore laughed and made the following reply. The Lord said, it has been well said by you, O good lady, that people go to their relations, even uninvited. But this happens only when the latter's mind, when their relation's mind is not tainted with malice due to excessive arrogance and anger born of self-identification with the body. The pride of the arrogant is heightened and their mind perverted by learning austerity, opulence, a charming personality, youth and pedigree, which are the six embellishments for the noble but a curse to the most wicked. And deprived of their judgment, they fail to perceive the glory of the most exalted. Considering them as one's own relations, one should never visit the house of such men of unsteady judgment, who view their visitors with a suspicious mind uh, and with angry and frowning eyes. One whose body has been mutilated with arrows by the enemy does not feel the same torture as he who has been cut to the quick by the abusive words of his own people having a malignant mind, his own family. For while the former is able to sleep on receiving proper treatment and nursing, someone who has been physically wounded, the latter who has been um, offended and emotionally hurt by their own family suffers from heartache day and night. You are surely the most beloved and so he's trying to protect her from the emotional pain of abuse by her father, which he knows is what will happen if she goes. You are surely the most beloved and esteemed of all the daughters of Daksha, the, the Prajapati of exalted rank, my charming lady, Yet you will not receive the attention of your father because of your connection with me, 
who is a source of great torment to him. He whose heart is burning and who feels troubled in mind at the sight of the glories of those exalted souls who stand as a witness to the mind of a jiva is unable easily to ascend the supreme heights reached by them and merely hates them, even as the demons hate Srihari. As regards the exchange of formalities in the shape of rising from one seat and advancing to meet a friend, respectful behavior and salutation, etc., the, the kind of the Vedic cultural protocols for when a guest arrives. O oh, slender wasted lady, it is properly done only by the wise who do all this mentally with respect to the supreme person dwelling in every heart and not to him who regards the body as his own self. So the, in other words, the proper way to greet someone is to greet absolutely anyone with the fullest respect since all of them are, are embodiments of Bhagavan. Um, and, and anyone who does it based on bodily relations is not doing it properly. It is the absolutely pure mind which is termed as Vasudeva because it is there that the Supreme Person is realized in his unmasked glory. It is in such a mind that I wait with obeisance, I, I wait upon with obeisance, Lord Vasudeva, who is beyond sense perception. Therefore, you should never look at the face of Daksha, even though he is your father, your very procreator, nor of those who are devoted to him because he bears ill will to me and offered indignity to me by abusing me, O charming lady, when I visited the sacrifice performed by the Prajapatis, even though I did no wrong to him. If you ignore my advice and go there, no good will come to you thereby. For when a man who is held in high esteem suffers indignity at the hands of a relation, the affront forthwith causes his death. Thus ends the third discourse, forming part of the dialogue between Goddess Uma and Lord Rudra in Book 4 of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana. Discourse four, Sati burns herself with the fire of yoga. Maitreya continued, having said this much, Lord Shankara, the bestower of happiness, became silent, for he thought the death of his consort was inevitable in either case, since he could see the karma that was coming. She swung like a pendulum, sallying forth in her eagerness to see her relations and then returning for fear of Lord Shiva for fear of Lord Shiva, meaning out of anxiousness because of what Shiva had said, telling her that, advising against it and telling her that no good would come of it. Vexed at the thwarting of her desire to see her relations and overpowered with emotion, she burst into tears and wept. Shaking with anger, Sati looked at her peerless Lord Bhava as if she would burn him. Thereafter, with a heart tormented by grief and anger and her judgment clouded by her womanish nature and heaving deep sighs, she proceeded to her parents' home, leaving Lord Shankara, the beloved of the saints, who had fondly given her half of his body. The servants of Lord Shiva, um, who was characterized by three eyes, in other words, the servants of Lord uh, Trayambaka, is how the text put it, Maniman, Mada, and others, these are the lords of the Bhutaganas, accompanied by his own personal attendants and yakshas, followed her apace in thousands, placing Nandishvara at their head, and free from remorse, in other words, they, they didn't have any second feelings about what they were doing, in part because they probably weren't privy to the conversation. They just figured that she's going and she should have an escort. Placing her on the chief of the bulls, so she was riding on Nandi, they traveled duly equipped with her sarika. Um, a sarika is a um, thrush-like bird or a type of parrot, generally brought up as a pet by high-ranked ladies. Um, it's kind of an old Indian custom that women would have a pet sarika and teach it to talk. Um, she brought her ball, her looking glass, a lotus flower, white umbrella, chowry, and wreath, and et cetera, all the insignias of royalty. Um, and kettle drums, conches, flutes, and other accompaniments of music. Sati reached her destination and entered the sacrificial grounds where Vedic hymns were already being chanted in every direction giving rise to a keen contest, each Brahmana trying to chant better than the others. Um, the sacrificial grounds were crowded with Brahmana seers and devas on all sides and strewn with utensils of clay, wood, iron, gold, kusha grass, and animal hides. Afraid of Daksha, the Yajamana, who treated her with disrespect, nobody paid any attention to her when she arrived there, since they, figured, they were worried that if they greeted her and showed their happiness to see her that Daksha might disapprove since they knew that they were estranged. Accepting, of course, her sisters and, and mother, 
who gladly and fondly embraced her, their throats choked with tears of love. Not addressed kindly by her father, Sati did not accept the presence or the exalted seat lovingly offered by her mother and her mother's sisters, nor did she receive the inquiries, uh, meaning gladly receive, the inquiries of her sisters about her health, even though they were couched in a most appropriate language. Seeing that no share of the sacrificial offerings had been allotted to Rudra, and that her father had shown great respect towards the omniscient Lord, and herself slighted in the sacrificial assembly since she received no formal greeting except from her mother and sisters. Sati flew into a rage as if she would burn the worlds with her fury. Controlling by her command the hosts of Bhutas that had accompanied her and who had sprung on their feet to kill Daksha at the end, seeing her rage, they were just ready to attack and she commanded them, no, hold back. She proceeded to reproach that enemy of Lord Shiva whose vanity had been tickled by his proficiency in the ritual, an accents faltering with anger within the hearing of the whole world. Um, the whole world, metaphorically speaking, to, to say that representatives of the whole world were present there. The worshipful goddess said, none other than you would antagonize him who is unsurpassed in this world, to whom no one is dear or hateful, who is the beloved self of all embodied beings, nay, who is the cause of all and is free from enmity. People like you, O Brahmana, discover faults even in the virtues of others, but there are some pious souls who never do so. The greatest of all are they, in other words, she's attacking his claim to be the, the greatest exponent of the Veda. She's pointing out that there are plenty of people better than him in spiritual realization. The greatest of all are they who are wont to magnify even the most trifling virtues and give great, great praise to any progress that anybody has made. You, however, have found fault even with such people. It is no wonder that those ignoble souls who declare the material body, which is no better than a corpse as the self, always indulge in maliciously reveling exalted souls. I suspect that was meant to be maliciously reviling exalted souls. Such a behavior befits those people since their glory is obscured by the dust of feet of those exalted souls. You hate Lord Shiva of sacred renown whose command is inviolable, nay, whose name of two syllables, Shiva, uttered with the tongue even once, and that too casually, immediately wipes out the sins of men. You are accursed indeed. You bear enmity to that befriender of the universe, whose lotus feet are not only resorted to by the bee-like minds of exalted souls, thirsting for honey in the shape of the joy of absorption in the absolute Brahman, but also shower the blessings sought after by interested people. Do not people other than you, such as Brahma, the creator, and others, who place on their heads, flowers, etc., drop from Shiva's feet, know him to be inauspicious, though bearing the appellation of Shiva, him who lived in the company of fiends and crematories, throwing about his matted locks and wearing on his person the wreaths lying there, as well as the ashes of funeral piles and human skulls. In other words, she's pointing out that, like, you say these things as insults, but Brahma knows all that, and he still, if a flower touched Shiva's foot, he'd wear it on his head. Obviously, that those things aren't valid concerns. A man should shut his ears and leave the place where his master, defender of righteousness, is being vituperated by unbridled men. In case he is powerless, or if he has the power, he should forcibly cut off the vile tongue that indulges in such blasphemy, and then give up his own life as well, if need be. Meaning, um, if attacking the person is going to end up getting you killed, go ahead and do it. Cut off the tongue of anyone who insults Shiva like this. She's ranting in her fury. Such is the course of duty, the course of dharma. Therefore, I shall no longer retain this body, begotten of you, a vilifier of the dark-necked Lord Shiva. For the wise declare that one gets purified only by vomiting the impure food consumed through ignorance. The mind of a great sage, reveling in his own self, does not invariably follow the utterances of the Vedas in the form of injunctions and interdictions, meaning that it a great sage who has attained self-knowledge does not anymore necessarily follow all the karmakanda rules and follow all the purity regulations and so on at once they're at that stage just as the movements of an immortal and a human being vary while the while the deva can tread on air the other can only walk on solid ground even so the ways of the enlightened and the ignorant are not alike therefore while holding fast exclusively to one's own duty one's svadharma 
one should never cast aspersions against another because you don't know what's right or what isn't right for someone else. Just pay attention to your own dharma. Activity in the shape of performing one's religious duties and that consisting of pursuits carried on in retirement, meaning the um, karma kanda or the path of renunciation are equally right, both being prescribed in the Vedas severally for the two types of men, the one characterized by worldly attachment and the other by its absence as will appear from the fact that the two are found incompatible in an agent practicing both at a time. But even as the one duty is not incumbent on the other type of men, so no duty of any kind devolves on Lord Shiva. He, he has no duties, only, for, only pure freedom. The natural gifts possessed by us, O Father, cannot be acquired by you. They are not extolled in sacrificial halls by creatures following the path of ritual and gratified with the food offered in sacrifices, for their origin is unknown and they are enjoyed only by the knowers of Brahman. I have no longer any use for this body of ignoble birth, sprung as it is from the loins of one who has sinned against Lord Shiva. Away, away with it. I am ashamed of my relationship with such a vile man. Accursed be the birth from him who offends against exalted souls. When Lord Shiva, whose banner bears the device of a bull, calls me by the name of Dakshayani, meaning Daksha's daughter, an appellation derived from your name, I shall feel deeply piqued and forget all mirth and smile. Therefore, I will forthwith cast off this corpse-like body begotten of you. Maitreya went on, having thus addressed Daksha in the sacrificial assembly, Ovidura, literally what he said is, O queller of enemies, um, is, is how Maitreya addressed Vidura. Sati sat down silent on the floor facing the north. She sipped water, wrapped herself with a yellow piece of linen, closed her eyes, and resorted to the device of shedding the body after the manner of the yogis. Having steadied herself in a squatting posture, so not, sit, not seated in Padmasana, but she's squatting, she brought the prana and apana airs on the same level at the navel, and forcing the Udana Vayu upwards from the mystical circle at the navel, from the Manipurika chakra, held the Udana Vayu in the region of the heart along with the intellect. Thereafter, the irreproachable lady drew the Vayu thus held in the region of the heart, the Udana Vayu, to the middle of her eyebrows through her throat. So up through, so in other words, she took it from the Manipurika chakra through her Anahata chakra, through her um, through her throat chakra into the Agnya chakra. Thus intending to drop her body, which had been lovingly placed on the lap more than once by Lord Shiva, the most adored even of exalted souls, as a mark of displeasure against Daksha, the strong-willed lady summoned the presence of air and fire in her limbs through concentration of mind. Thereafter, Sati was so completely absorbed in enjoying with her mind the honey of the lotus feet of her Lord Bhagavan Shankara, the preceptor of the whole world, the Jagat Guru, that she perceived none else. She was thereby rid of the last traces of impurity in the shape of the idea that she was the daughter of Daksha, and her body was soon ablaze with the fire produced by deep meditation. There ensued in the heavens as well as on the earth a tremendous uproar among those who witnessed this most extraordinary event. Alas, people cried, Angered by Daksha, goddess Sati, the beloved spouse of the most adorable divinity, has given up the ghost. Uh, look at the enormous wickedness of this Prajapati, who is the father of all these mobile and immobile creatures, and slighted by whom Sati, his own, his own high-souled daughter, gave up her life. Sati, who ever deserved honor at his hands, possessed of a jealous heart and an enemy of the Supreme Spirit, he will incur great infamy in the world. People will say that this Shiva hater did not forbid his own begotten child when she was preparing to die because of the ill treatment received from him. So even when she announced that she was going to die and then did this yogic procedure, which took some time, he still didn't tell her to stop. He didn't rush to apologize. He didn't, he just watched. While the people were observing thus Sati's attendants who saw the wonderful self-immolation rose with uplifted weapons to kill Daksha. Seeing the vehemence of their onrush, the worshipful Bhrigu poured oblations into the, uh, the Dakshin Agni, the southern fire. Um, so at a great yagni like this, there's not just one homakund, there's, um, there's several. So the southern fire, 
they all have different purposes. It's um, the Karmakanda, the Veda gets into detail. But uh, so here he poured oblations into the Dakshinagni, the southern fire, reciting the text of the Yajur Veda, possessing the efficacy of killing those who are out to wreck a yajna. While the sage, since there's an onrushing horde of Mutaganas attacking, while the sage Brigu, as he was the officiating priest, um, so Daksha was the Yajamana, meaning the um, the sponsor of the yajna, and the Yajamana also has certain mantras and such that they do, but the officiating priest was Brigu. While he was pouring these oblations, heavenly beings called the Ribhus, who had attained to the sphere of the moon god by dint of austere penance that they had done in the past, rose up from the sacrificial pit in thousands with great force. Um, rose with great force, meaning kind of like came erupting out of it like it was a volcano. Beaten by these divinities who were armed with firebrands and resplendent with the spiritual glow investing a holy brahmana, all the pramatas, um, along with the guhyakas, these are different types of Shiva's attendants, ran away in various directions. Thus ends the fourth discourse entitled The Self-Immolation of Sati in Book 4 of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanhita. Discourse 5, Virabhadra wrecks Daksha's sacrifice and beheads him. Maitreya continued, Lord Shiva's fury knew no bounds when he learned from Narada that Sati had burnt herself to death on being slighted by Daksha Prajapati, and that the host of his own attendants had been driven away by the Ribhus who had appeared from Daksha's yajna. Sharply biting his lips in rage, Lord Shiva, who bore a heavy burden of matted locks on his head, pulled up one of those clotted locks. So not just a hair, but like a whole clotted lock of hair, like ripped out a big chunk of his hair, which shone brightly like a flash of lightning or as a flame of fire, and springing on his feet all at once, laughed with a deep roar and dashed the lock against the ground. From that lock sprang up a colossal being, Virabhadra by name, whose tall figure touched the skies, who was possessed of a thousand arms, and dark like a cloud, had three eyes bright as the sun, fierce teeth and matted hair shining like flaming fire, wore a garland of skulls and was armed with various uplifted weapons. When he prayed with joined palms, command me what to do. Lord Shiva, the Lord of the Spirits, said, you being my part manifestation, of valiant Rudra, lead my warriors and dispose of Daksha and his sacrifice. Enjoined thus by the wrathful Rudra, who is anger personified, Virabhadra went round the all-pervading Lord, like one round of Parikrama around him, the adored of all the gods, and departed. At that time he thought himself, by virtue of his irresistible force, as capable of braving the might of the most powerful, O oh dear Vidura, he thundered most terribly in lifting his trident, which was capable of destroying even death, um, killing even Yamaraja. He ran, followed by the attendants of Sri Rudra, who were roaring violently, the anklets about his ankles making a jingling sound. Seeing dust in the northern quarter, the priests officiating at the sacrifice, the Yajamana, Daksha, those assembled there, and all the other Brahmanas and their wives, thought on the other side, um, meaning on the other side of the mountains. So the dust is from the northern quarter because, of course, they're coming from the Himalayas down from Kailasa. They thought, what can this darkness be? Whence has this dust come? Winds are not blowing, and there are certainly no robbers, for Raja Prachinabarhi, who rules with an iron rod, is still alive. So there wouldn't be like onrushing bandits or anything. Nor is it the time for cows being hurriedly taken back. Whence has this dust? Is the world preparing for its doom now? Seems like a frequent, frequent thought that if anything out of the ordinary happens, people wonder if the world is ending. Troubled in mind, Prasuti, Daksha's wife, and the other ladies observed, this is nothing but the consequence of the wrong perpetrated by Daksha Prajapati, who before the very eyes of his daughters slighted his innocent daughter Sati. Or it, uh, um, it, this is the fruit of the offense committed against Sri Rudra, who dances at the time of destruction throwing about the tuft of his matted hair and extending his banner-like arms equipped with uplifted weapons, when the Lord of Elephants presiding over the quarters are pierced by the prongs of his trident and the quarters rent with his thunder-like peals of laughter. Nay, possessed of a dazzling splendor and filled with anger, he assumes an unbearable aspect by his knit brows, and the whole group of constellations, the nakshatras, 
is scattered by his frightful teeth. Having angered him, can anyone fare well, even if the individual provoking him is the creator himself? So the women there are less um, afflicted by ego than Daksha and their other husbands, and they are the ones who have first realized what's really happening here. While the people were saying many such things with perturbation in their eyes, there appeared on all sides, in the heavens as well as on earth, again and again, thousands of ill omens of the worst type, causing fear even to the strong-minded Daksha. By this time, Ovidura, the followers of Rudra, who were armed with various uplifted weapons and were dwarfish in stature, some red-brown and others tawny of hue, and had bellies and faces resembling those of a crocodile. So they're like scaled and have like a paler underbelly and a darker back and have like a long fanged snouts and so on. They ran up in all directions and surrounded that spacious sacrificial ground. Some of them broke the beam resting on the eastern and western pillars of the sacrificial hall of the Yajnashala, while others destroyed the apartment reserved for the wives of the Yajamana and the priests, which is to the west of the, of the Yajnashala, as well as the assembly hall in front of the Yajnashala, the cottage in front of the assembly hall where the ghee and other substances are stored, the hut occupied by the Yajamana himself, since of course, and this is like a many day, possibly even many year yajna, so there's residences on site for the Yajamana and priests and so on. Um, and they destroyed the kitchen. Some smashed the sacrificial vessels and extinguished the sacred fires, while others urinated into the yajna kundas and snapped the cotton threads marking the boundaries of the sacrificial dais in the north. Some molested the hermits while others threatened the wives, and still others seized the devas who were sitting close to them even though they tried to run away. Maniman, Maniman is one of the chiefs of the Bhutaganas, bound the sage Bhrugu. Virabhadra bound Daksha Prajapati himself. Chandisha, the, um, the god uh, Pusha Deva, and Nandishvara seized Bhaga Deva. Seeing this and being most severely pelted with stones, all the priests officiating at the sacrifice, as well as those assembled there, including the heavenly beings, ran in various directions. The worshipful Virabhadra, a part avatar of Lord Bhava, pulled up the mustaches and beard of Bhrigu, who was pouring oblations into the sacrificial fire, so ripped his mustache and his beard out, out of his face. Um, while he was still holding the sacrificial ladle, the um, sruk, it's called the yajna sruk, in his hand, and who had laughed at Lord Shiva and open assembly, proudly displaying his mustaches. So he kind of like, well, kind of puffed up with pride when Daksha was speaking, he kind of proudly brandished his mustache and Shiva remembered that. So Virabhadra is now ripping it out. Lord Virabhadra angrily knocked down Bhaga at one of the devas, one of the adityas, to the ground and plucked out his eyes inasmuch as he had in the assembly of the Prajapatis countenance Daksha in his calamation of Lord Shiva by blinking. So I guess he blinked in such a way as to express that he agreed with Daksha. Even as Lord Balarama knocked down the teeth of the king of the Kalingas, that's referring to another story which we'll get much later, so Virabhadra dashed off the teeth of Pusha, who had laughed showing his teeth while Shiva was being vilified. Setting his foot, um, Pusha or Pushan is another of the Adityas. So um, smashed his teeth out. Um, Pushan still in the Vedic rituals is offered only kind of porridge and gruels and stuff because it's said that he still doesn't have teeth. Um, so he's not offered any food that requires chewing. Setting his foot on Daksha's breast after knocking him down, the three-eyed Virabhadra proceeded to cut off his head with a sharp-edged weapon, but he failed to sever it. Virabhadra, who was, no, uh, who was no other than an avatar of Lord Shiva, was filled with great wonder when he found that no weapon or missile could even cut Daksha's skin and pondered for a long time. Observing the way in which animals were being slaughtered for the sacrifice, so this, they were practicing animal sacrifice at this yajna of Daksha, and there's a Vedically consecrated, um, it's, it's almost like a cleaver, something that can like take the head off even a bull in a clean strike, a very thick cleaver concentrated with Vedic mantras. So Virabhadra took that and severed the head of Daksha from his body in the same way, 
treating the yajamana, the sacrificer, as an animal to be sacrificed, and that did it. There arose a shout of applause from the ghosts, spirits, and fiends who extolled that achievement of Virabhadra, while others raised an outcry against the same, the, the ones who were on Daksha's side. Full of anger, Virabhadra threw Daksha's head as an offering into the Dakshin Agni, into the southern fire. And setting fire to the whole sacrificial edifice, he left for Mount Kailasa. Thus ends the fifth discourse on the destruction of Daksha's Yagna in book four of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. And I'm thinking that that might be a good place to stop because there's actually a lot more to this, to this whole story, um, more than I think we're going to get through today. And the next section kind of, it kind of ends that cycle of the action and the next is calming down and getting everybody to agree and um, fixing things, so to speak. Um, so it seems to me like that's probably a good stopping place for us today. Thank you all for coming. It's kind of an interesting passage. One of the passages in the Bhagavatam that's more um, Shaiva in character. Um, it's more than once explicitly praised Shiva as, as Bhagavan himself, as the soul of the universe. And it, it does point out that Shiva himself is also a worshiper of Janardana. But there are these passages even in the Vaishnava Puranas like that, and, and likewise in the Jaiva Puranas that revere Vishnu. Thank you very, very, very much, Devala. It's always, uh, I don't have words, <laughs> but. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. it's beautiful and thank you so much. And when you were exp expressing verbally about the mustache and that, <laughs> I, yeah. I remember we used to do the, the what we call is a dance drama, right? Uh -huh. the performing the whole. And uh, I kind of remember those gestures of, you know, like the Ravanas and all that, like, like, yeah, how they kind of, yeah, it was kind of like exactly. playing with the eyes, right? Yep. And then the mustache, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How they'll kind of like the proud and, and they have thick mustache like this. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is a drama. So we had the fake ones, but then right. yeah, you yeah. kind of curl it like this and you go and play with the eyes. Right? Exactly. So, yeah. I've seen the, I've seen the exact same thing. Yeah. Right. And those, yeah. those. Uh, in India. Right. I think we need to turn off the recording. Okay. <laughs>